Okay, does everyone who wants beer have beer? <laughs> this is good beer. That was Code Guard, right? Brought the beer? Yeah, thank you, Code Guard. Awesome. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk about speech enabling web applications. Uh, before I get into that, I did want to introduce myself since I've actually not spoken here before and I've kind of hidden in the background. But my name is Ben Klang. Um, I'm the president of a company called Mojo Lingo, which is actually based here. Um, by the way, we are hiring. I didn't actually mention that earlier, but if anyone's interested in what I'm talking about and uh, want to do it professionally, come talk to me afterward. So Mojo Lingo, I'm actually based in Decatur, um, and I'm also the lead of an open source project called Adhesion. So has anyone heard of Adhesion? Yeah, sweet. Okay, good. Uh, and used it? Yeah, okay. Um, so this talk isn't about Adhesion, uh, although it's, it's uh, tangentially related to it. Um, but I will talk about that more later. What we're really here to talk about today is adding speech to the web. So a lot of this talk is going to be around HTML5. Shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Um, there are three mechanisms in particular that are, that are interesting here. The speech input API, the text to speech API, which honestly isn't really an API, it's just the audio tag, and WebRTC. So real quick, who has heard of WebRTC? Okay. Uh, a lot of this talk is going to be at WebRTC and why I think it's so awesome. So I'm going to put some links up here real quick. I'll have these again at the end of the presentation. If you really want to get into the details, these two links will actually cover the browser APIs that I'll be talking about. Um, but I don't want to go that low level yet. So again, they'll be on, those links will be on at the end of the uh, presentation. So first, let's talk about the speech input API. Um, most of you have probably seen this page before, Google. Uh, yeah, right, it's uh, pretty familiar. This little speech, I get this microphone icon, you may have seen that. So what that is, is this. It's an input tag, I've made that bigger. It's an input tag for a text field that has an attribute of X WebKit speech. And what that is, is a speech enabled input form. Um, has anyone actually clicked it and tried it? Like two of you, really? Three? Oh, I'm disappointed. Where's the curiosity? All right, so we're going to try it right now. Um, let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm not sure. Uh, quick flip of the wrong button. All right, let's mirror. So we have the Google. And we're going to hit a button here. So let's search using voice. <laughs> let's time that better. All right, well, that worked, but let's do something better. Are you feeling lucky, punk? Yes. So it works pretty well, right? I mean, that was not only very quick, but you actually saw your words appearing as you typed it. And all you need to do in your web applications is add that X WebKit speech to your input fields. So done. All right, is it thank just you. A Chrome extension? <laughs> <laughs> Talks over. Talks over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, is it a Chrome extension? It is not a Chrome extension. It is actually uh, built into Chrome, the browser. Uh, and technically, it is an open standard. It's actually the HTML5 speech input API. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. But let me flip back to keynote mode. All right, so that was pretty cool. Um, and obviously, really, really simple to turn on. Um, but that's not the only thing it can do. There is, uh, there's another, so that, that mode is where you tie specific input to a specific field, right? So I click the button and I speak and went to text silence. It takes whatever I've said and turns it into text and sticks it in the field. So it's kind of like a one shot mode. There's another mode called streaming and it's implemented using a library called Anyang, which if you are fans of Arrested Development may recognize uh, the character there. So Anyang is pretty cool. Uh, it uses the same mechanism but instead of tying input to a field, it's just constantly listening. So uh, we actually have a demo of this library. And I don't know if you can see it. If you want to find Anyang, I'll put a link up at the end of the uh, presentation. But I have a demo for Anyang as well. This is actually running on my machine here. OK. So you'll notice that. It's also asking me if it can use uh, the camera and the microphone. Um, we didn't actually finish 
all that we had planned, because this is uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon, I said, hey, let's do a demo. Um, but anyway, we will do the speech recognition. So you can see here we've got a little character on the screen and a video thing we're not going to use. But this guy is listening to me as I'm talking. And I can stop at any time and I can say, hello. And so he's listening constantly. And as it hears what I'm saying, it'll react to it. So you can do anything. It's a JavaScript callback, right? You can navigate within the page. You can do something else. Um, the, uh, the woman I work with who designed this, her name is Mel. And uh, she has a sense of humor. So if I say, Mel, Mel, and then uh, she brags. Uh, and there are other things. So right, everything that's connected to this, now that we have access to the camera, we can do something else like, uh, let's take a picture. Say cheese. And it took a picture. <laughs> so you can tie a lot of these things together and you can start to see how you can use your voice, your uh, words, to actually drive your web interactions. It's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Oops. Let's flip back to presentation. So that is the speech input API, um, but it has some caveats. Unfortunately, it's not all rainbows. Um, it is Chrome only, and that is the biggest problem. Right now, it's only implemented in Chrome. Um, it uses Google's ASR, which is actually really good. It's the speech recognition. I don't know if you guys, well, you've seen all the voicemail transcriptions they've done through Google Voice, right? They also had Goog 4 for a while. They have probably the largest database of audio recordings anyone has collected. They've run all that through their ASR algorithms. It's a very good recognition algorithm. There was, thanks to a Google Summer of Code project last year, a partial implementation for Firefox. Um, I don't know where that ended up. I think it kind of tapered off. I don't think it got merged. So basically, we're back to just being able to use this in Chrome. It also requires a speech recognition server. And I apologize. I should have spelled out that acronym. It stands for Automatic Speech Recognition. It's a telco term, and I, I should forget uh, my acronyms. But anyway, a speech recognition server is required. Chrome obviously uses Google's. It's pretty much hard-coded to use the Google speech recognition server. And there is only one server I know of that actually supports the interface required to do speech recognition in the browser, and it is Google's. You can kind of see where this is going, right? The spec does provide for a service URI attribute. So theoretically, if someone will do the work of providing an API, um, you can point this at another server. And the important thing here is if you're thinking about use cases in, say, payment or PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance, where you don't want the audio to be sent across the internet, um, encrypted or not, right? It's out of your control. That may not be acceptable for your use case. You should be able to use the service URI and point it at a recognition server behind the firewall, keep everything uh, secure. Um, unfortunately, Google didn't implement the service URI attribute. So pretty much as it stands today, if you're using Chrome and you're willing to use Google's servers, you're in good shape. And if not, you kind of have to wait. Um, and that's the rest of the bad news, is that the maturity seems kind of slow on this one. Seems like every, uh, every six months or so, we'll get new uh, traffic on the mailing list. But it's not moving super fast. Um, but maybe if everybody uh, asks for it, it'll move faster. I don't know. So that's speech input. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's talk about the other half of that, which is text-to-speech. So text-to-speech is really pretty... Uh, pretty simple in HTML5. It's really just an API where you pass text in, you get an audio file back out, and you embed it in the document with the audio tag. Really is very straightforward. So it, rather than go into much detail over this, I'm just going to tell you about some of the various TTS API options that are available. And there are several, and they're very good. Um, the first one I like to mention is AT&T. And you wouldn't normally think of AT&T as an API provider, but they have a developer program, and it's really good. And they have speech recognition, not compatible with the speech input, but they do have a speech recognition API. Um, but they also have text-to-speech. And they have a pretty great deal. It's $100 a year for a million transactions a month. And we have not hit that limit yet. Uh, some people will, but um, if you just want to go experiment with it, that's a really low-cost way to get started playing with text-to-speech. The only main drawback to AT&T is that it's limited. They only implement English and Spanish right now. If you need more languages, then I would suggest something like Nuance. Nuance is the 8,000-pound gorilla in the speech recognition world. Um, they gobbled up all of the other speech recognition and text-to-speech companies, with only a couple exceptions. The upshot of that is they support 
more languages than anyone else. So I'm going to say something like 40 languages. It's, it's actually quite a long list. Um, they, they support it for both speech recognition and text-to-speech. And again, uh, you register with them, you hit their API with a bit of text, you get back an audio file, embed that in your document. Uh, they're a little more expensive. It's something like a penny per transaction, so that can add up if you have any volume. Um, and the last I'll mention is Google. And Google's couldn't be simpler. Literally hit this URL, uh, translate TTS, you pass it a language and some text, and you get back an audio file. The main problem with this is you can't pay for it, which means that if they decide to change their API or if they decide to discontinue it, you're kind of out of luck. Um, so you're on your own. Um, I'll talk about more about that in just a second. So there are some caveats, right? You can't pay for Google. Um, we actually had a customer who tried to go to production using Google's text-to-speech and very quickly found out they were rate limited. So that, that wasn't going to work. He ended up switching to uh, Nuance in this, in this case. One other thing that's kind of strange is the browser, the standard for the audio tag, doesn't specify a mandatory to implement format, um, which means that you end up with different browsers supporting different audio uh, formats, kind of a pain. The good news is it's mostly consistent. Um, pretty much everyone supports MP3. There was one that didn't. I think it was, it was, some, it was more obscure. It might have been Opera. Um, but pretty much everyone supports MP3 and MP3 in containerized format. So if you container it in H.264 or MP4, it'll still work. So it's pretty easy. Everyone except IE does Ogvorbis, Opus, and WebM, which are more open standard, um, you know, royalty-free codecs, which are always good. And if you want a more in-depth look at this, the people at Mozilla put together a really great page that talks about all the different browsers and all the different formats that are supported by each browser. It's a little bit out of date now, but it definitely gives you a, a good starting point. So that's speech input and text-to-speech. And this brings me to my favorite part, which is WebRTC. So usually when I go to these conferences, I have to, or when I give these talks, I have to talk about, I have to explain what WebRTC is. And so people ask me, well, what is WebRTC to you? And the kind of obvious answer is telephones and web browsers. And that sounds exciting, right? Right? OK, so it's, it's not. I mean, it is that. You can certainly do this, and a lot of people will do this. But this isn't really the exciting part. Um, WebRTC fundamentally is the ability to get control of the camera and the microphone in the browser. No plugins, no Flash, no Java. Uh, once it's finally adopted in all browsers, then it'll be uh, a uniform API um, available everywhere. The ubiquity is good. Um, they won't, you won't have plugins that are crashing or consuming all the CPU. Like, this is going to be a really good thing. So very quickly, high level, how does WebRTC work? We have a web server. And this web server, I picked Apache because I kind of wanted to illustrate. It's really nothing special at all. Um, it doesn't require web sockets. It doesn't require much of anything. You just need a web server that can be used to host and get, right? And we have two people. We have Alice and Bob. And Alice is running Firefox, and Bob is running Chrome, and they want to set up a video call. So Alice invokes the uh, WebRTC APIs, specifically Pure Connection, and grabs this, uh, basically passes in some constraints, like I've got video, I've got audio, um, and it gets back this blob of text, which is called an SDP. And SDP stands for Session Description Protocol. I'm not going to go into details on that, because it's a big, hairy mess. Uh, but the important thing is she takes this blob of text and sends it to the web server. And the web server knows where to find Bob. So you can see in the request that Alice wants to talk to Bob. And the, the blob of text contains all of the information required for Bob to communicate with Alice. So it contains the IP address. It contains the uh, audio codecs to use. It contains uh, the offer, which, you know, hey, I want video and audio. All that stuff is in the STP. So all the web server has to do is make sure Bob gets it. And to underscore this point, um, you can actually do this exchange using, say, a text file and a USB stick. It's totally nonsensical, but the point is that this is a really dumb negotiation. There's no special magic to it. So Bob gets this request, comes up with his own SDP, and sends it back to Alice. So now both sides have each other's connection information. They know what each other wants, they know the codecs required, and they know the network addresses that are possible. So then a whole bunch of packets start flying between Alice and Bob. The first is ICE, uh, Internet Connectivity Establishment. Then you get STUN, which is simple traversal over, uh, of UDP over NAT, something like that. And then you get TURN, uh, which is a uh, relay server, basically. And none of those things are terribly important to you because, for the most part, they happen all 
as if by magic. And what ends up happening is that as a result of all of those packets, you should be able to pass media directly between browsers. So that means that and encryption is mandatory as part of the specification. So that SRTP there, the S is secure. It's uh, protected by DTLS, basically an extension of SSL that we use for e-commerce. So the, the media is not flowing through the web server at all. It's actually flowing direct from peer to peer. If you're on the same LAN, on the same wireless network, on the same wired network, in theory, that negotiation won't happen behind the firewall. So it won't actually even leave the network. It's pretty cool, and that's actually a, a part of ICE is what pulls that off. So obviously, because we're communicating securely, um, we can keep the NSA out of it. We hope. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the common use case for WebRTC, which is a peer-to-peer -peer connection. There are other ways. Uh, WebRTC is fundamentally a set of standards, so you don't have to necessarily be a browser to implement it. FreeSwitch and Asterisk, which are open source telephony engines, they implement the, the primitives necessary for WebRTC. So in this case, let's imagine replacing the web server with something like FreeSwitch. And now when Alice sends her request, to get a hold of Bob, in this case, FreeSwitch responds directly with its own SDP. So you'll notice that we're negotiating directly between Alice and FreeSwitch. Of course, FreeSwitch then turns around and sends a modified version of the request to Bob, basically swapping out the connectivity information so that Bob's audio also goes back to FreeSwitch. So when the call is finally set up, they're still talking end to end. The media, the audio, and the video is flowing through FreeSwitch. So that's pretty cool because you can do a lot of things with it now. You can put them into a conference. You can gateway to the public telephone network, right? So I can actually make it so that those two people in a conversation can then call my cell phone and then three of us are talking. Um, we can invoke uh, speech recognition. We can do play audio files into the conference. We can do all these things, you know, record the calls and archive them for later use. We can do all these things because the media is going through free switch. You can wiretap them. That's right. Um, I didn't, that's why NSA is not on this one. Uh, but yeah, but you get a lot more functionality. And so there are use cases where this is more important. Uh, compliance, actually. If you, we, we built an app not too long ago for uh, financial services. And basically, they have to record every call. So we route the calls through a recording point. So to kind of make clear, I talked earlier about how WebRTC isn't just telephones and web browsers, right? So I kind of want to break beyond that. And I think this group will understand. I do lot, this talk a lot for telephony people, and sometimes they kind of get this tunnel vision around uh, the telephone is the only way that communication can happen. Um, I think you guys probably don't feel that way, but still it's useful to walk through some of the possibilities. So I just kind of put together two examples. And I've got a quote here from a friend of mine, Jeff Hollingworth, who works with AT&T. Um, and this is, this is the, the thought that was in my head as I was coming up with these examples. He said, communicating isn't going to be what you're doing. It's what you'll be doing while you're doing something else. So today we tend to think of communication as I pick up my phone and my primary activity is I'm talking to you on the phone. Right? That's, that is, other stuff is a distraction from that fundamentally. But tomorrow, the communications will just be another channel embedded into the application. So maybe my primary function is I want to get customer service because I need to buy an airplane ticket. So my function is I'm buying the airplane ticket. Communications are just a layer to facilitate that. And it'll be added, it'll be an enhancement, something on top of the task I'm trying to accomplish. So the first example I've got is incident response. Um, my background, I started uh, my career as a systems administrator. So I spent a lot of late nights picking up the pieces of servers that blew up. So this was the first example that came to my mind. Um, what if we had a tool that would make it easier to coordinate the people working to rescue a dead system? So in this case, we've got a, uh, an Oracle server that's down. And you can see... This is not a real tool, by the way. This is uh, my creative Photoshop, so don't, don't try to go buy this or anything. Um, but if you can build it, someone will buy it. I'm sure of it. OK, so on the left, we've got this. This is actually uh, HipChat. Is a, I borrowed HipChat there. And you can see we've, we've got a chat session going, right? And people are familiar with HipChat, Campfire, same idea. Not only is it chat person to person, but it's also external messaging. So when someone pushes to Git, or when a notification comes in from the monitoring system, those things get streamlined into the chat window. So we all have this contextual uh, update of what's going on in the environment. Of course, the WebRTC piece of it, we've got a live video chat going. Everybody can see each other. Everybody can hear each other. We can discuss the problem in real time. It's, you know, this way I can type and talk at the same time. It's a faster communication medium. And if we're also pulling in at the bottom here information from various monitoring 
services. So we have a view of the network, and we can see whether communication is, is, uh, is functioning throughout the network. We've got bandwidth usage, so we can kind of start to see trends and how much bandwidth is being used. And free disk space and memory, because how many times does a server crash because it ran out of disk space? Um, but all that stuff is brought into one view, and we can use all this information to solve the problem much more quickly than trying to get everybody on this really uh, kind of low quality audio conference bridge. And by the way, the audio codecs that are mandatory for WebRTC is the successor to what Skype uses. Skype uses a codec called Silk, which is known as a ultra wideband codec, which is to say actually better than CD quality. It's 48,000 hertz uh, sample rate. And this is the successor to that. It's so good you can actually play music on it and have a realistic result from it. So I mean, it's, it's a very high quality audio stream, much higher than, say, telephone, which is 8,000 hertz and very narrow band. So looking at this incident response, there are several uh, important things we can take away from it. First is we get all that information in a timely and contextual way. We can adapt for mobile and desktop users. Because this is a browser function and not a plugin, we can actually use the browser uh, as a part of um, the delivery mechanism. We can actually resize and re-present uh, the information in something that makes sense for each platform. We can uh, use group-based communication, and we can inherit from existing groups. So the ops team probably all exists in some active directory somewhere. I can push a button, notify all of them to join into this conference. And not only can I get them into this conference, we can create one-time URLs, and we can send them to people so, they, so a third party, a vendor who wants to help troubleshoot can click a link, and they'll be brought into the conference as well. And again, nothing to download. There's no like WebEx plugin to go grab, no, um, not even the Google thing you have to download to make Hangouts work, right? It's all built into the browser. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you can federate with the external services. So you can get those notifications pushed into your chat where somebody pushes to GitHub. And it's all part of the same context. And because all this is flowing through a web server, we can log in and record all of it. So we, uh, we maybe attach links to the recordings to the ticket tracking system. Six months later, when this thing breaks again, we go find the ticket, we take it to the resolution, we can actually see and hear the decisioning process that went into it. It preserves much more information. So I have one other example. Uh, this is medical records management. So we have an electronic uh, medical records app here. And you can see in the upper right corner, I'm logged in as myself. What you can't see is the screen before this, I, I was able to use two-factor authentication. I had Google Authenticator on my phone, a one-time password, and I, have, of course, had my password. So the, the service definitely has a, a strong idea that this is me, right? This isn't me calling in and giving the last four digits of my social security number. This is actually a much stronger form of authentication. And I can, uh, so I've got the log of all the times I've called my doctor. In this case, I called my ophthalmologist. Um, and you can see the date of the call. You can see the transcript. So the doctor took notes as we, as we talked, and he posted those notes online. I can actually hear the recording. So if, you know, if he told me I need to take it three times a day, did I hear three or four? I can't remember. I can go listen to the recording and be sure. Um, but then if I have a follow-up question, I can hit one of these blue buttons, and I can actually talk to the on-call doctor. And instead of going through some crazy phone menu where I have to enter the last four digits of my social security number, I'm already authenticated. So they know, uh, some mentioned earlier, the click path. You can actually know which parts of the site I visited right before I called you get to take advantage of this secure authentication. It's a much better user experience because you don't have to look up any phone numbers. You just click, and you're talking to someone right there. So for medical records management, we can automate the medical claims, um, reduce the staff required to serve customers here. Um, we can use secure caller authentication. We can reuse the primary authentication from the website to secure the phone call, which is a win. Um, if you really want to get crazy, you can actually cross-check against location, geocoding. Um, or you can actually use voice biometrics. So my voice is my passport, verify me kind of thing. You know, I can actually build that in as well. And of course, we'll record and transcribe the whole thing. So whatever medical advice given to the patient is added to his record and, um, and added to the patient file. So when I go see another doctor, if I move, then all that information will still be accessible. And all of the recording information can be made available for uh, service quality, making, making sure the doctor really did give the right advice. Okay, so let's do one other demo here. If you have a recent Chrome or Firefox browser and a laptop, it has to be a laptop, it can't be a mobile device, but if you have a recent Firefox or Chrome browser and you feel like uh, playing with fire here, if you go to this page, what should happen is everybody who hits this page will end up in a live 
multi-party video conference. No plugins. Should just work. I hope. It does not work on phones yet. And I'll get to that in the caveats in just a minute. But give this a shot and let's see what happens. So what's gonna, as you guys are pulling this out, I'll explain. What's going to happen is you're going to go to this site and you're going to sub, your, your browser will send the SDP to the server. The server will then share everybody's SDP with everybody else who connects. And because we are all, everyone's on GT Visitor, should be on GT Visitor. So everyone who is on GT Visitor, because you're on the same network, all that video and all that audio will actually be local. So we won't be saturating the internet connection, not that we could actually saturate Georgia Tech's internet connection, um, but we wouldn't be loading it at all. All of the communication should happen locally. So I'm going to try it too, and let's just see if it works. From the giggling I'm hearing, I'm thinking it might actually be working. <laughs> what happened? I don't know. Uh, I think it might have just figured out that I wasn't plugged into my there we go. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of you. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty cool. So that was pretty seamless, right? And you guys just kind of dropped right into that conference. And that's, that's part of the power of WebRTC. So now imagine adding this to any application, any web application you're building. You start to get an idea for just what you can do with it. Frozen. Who's frozen? And so this is happening yeah, over the local network, right? Like yes. All these the video streams are only going over the local network. Wow. That's really cool. Which you know helps with the quality too, right? We're not we're not uh, uh, we're not losing the latency of actually going to the internet and back. This is all happening locally. They almost have a pretty bunch of squares going. <laughs> yeah, we kind of do. Hollywood <laughs> Square. <laughs> So you guys should play with this. It's pretty fun. It's called Talkie.io. It's made by the guys at um, And Yet. They just wrote a book called Human JavaScript. Um, they're really funny. They did the real-time conference in Portland a couple weeks ago. Um, anyway, it's good stuff. All right. Multi-chat room. Have you tried the together JS? Sorry? Have you tried the together JS? I have not tried together JS. There is it another WebRTC. From Mozilla. Okay. Uh, was that the shared browsing thing where you can? That is cool. It just came out. You can add it to your application. And it sounds like you you can send the link to someone else, and that sets up the protocol. Yeah. So my understanding with with that is that you're actually browsing the same sites together. Like your your browsers are kind of slaved together, and you can you can chat while browsing the sites. Something like that. It's, it's a very cool, another use case for WebRTC. Um, all right, so there, there are some caveats to WebRTC. It's not quite perfect. Um, the main problem is it's still kind of bleeding edge. The standard is not finalized. In fact, uh, there was a meeting of the IETF last week in Vancouver where um, they went head to head trying to figure out what is going to be the mandatory video codec. And the combatants are VP8 and H.264 which translates to Google and everybody else. Um, I have my own thoughts. I'm sure lots of other people do too. There are good arguments both sides. At this point, basically, the two sides are at an impasse. It's going to go to like an 11th round of I don't even know what. But basically, as soon as that's figured out, that will be kind of the last. VP8 free? Yeah, OK, so real quickly, VP8, um, Google bought, paid a bunch of money, like a billion dollars for a company called Gitz. Which owned, uh, which was owned the precursor of VP8. So it's this um, really advanced codec for video, and they gave it away. They said license-free, royalty-free VP8 is in the public domain, which is awesome. The problem is everybody else had pretty much adopted H.264. H.264 is great, except that it's under, uh, it's controlled by the MPEG licensing. Uh, authority or licensing agency, which basically means once you get above a few hundred thousand deploys, you have to start paying a licensing fee, a royalty, to use their codec. Um, most devices and operating systems have a license built into them. So one of the big arguments for H.264 is that basically everybody on the planet already has an H.264 license, and in a lot of cases, hardware encoding in the mobile device, which is a huge power saver. Um, but for companies who are kind of startups and want to really get into WebRTC, the licensing fees required by MPEG-LA are kind of onerous. So the argument with VP8 is entirely free. You know, free as in beer, free as in speech. And so um, 
That's the debate. And you know, my, my personal hope is I would love to see VP8 win. The, pragma, the pragmatist in me says, I don't know if it's going to happen. Cisco. Are you familiar with the Cisco event? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Cisco event. So for those not familiar, Cisco very recently said, guess what, everybody? We're going to pay for all your H.264 licenses. Sweet. Um, yes, sweet. So the nice thing is anybody who wants H.264 can go download this binary from Cisco, and they're committing to compile it for a whole bunch of different platforms. Anyone see the problem with this already? Um, yeah, they've, they basically promised to give away H.264 within MPEG-LA. You're not solving the underlying problem, which is that fundamentally it's not free. Um, if they don't provide a binary for your platform, you have to ask them to do it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Um, in the end, they're giving away binaries. And with the whole NSA thing recently, there are a lot of people who are going to be very suspicious of an American company giving away binaries to audio video codecs. And at the end of the day, they not, won't necessarily be optimized for your platform. And you can't necessarily go, if you compile it from source, Technically, and they will be releasing the source code, I should, I should caveat. Cisco is not only giving away the binary, they're also giving away the source code. The problem is, if you compile the source code yourself, you don't fall under Cisco's license. So technically, you now owe MPEG-LA licensing fees. If it's stable compile, you should be able to maybe compare your output to make sure it doesn't have maybe. code in it. Maybe. But uh, you've heard of compilers that can uh, backdoor themselves. And well, you just need to compile a few things and then it's fine. People did it with TrueCrypt recently. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying, I'm yeah, saying it's, it's, it's imperfect. Fun, it's yeah, <laughs> It's nice that they did it. And really, when it comes down to it, they're just trying to preserve their existing deploys of H.264. They have invested a lot in deploying H.264 infrastructure. And it, it makes sense for them. Um, you know, like I said, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, OK, so it's Bleeding Edge. It is only available on Chrome and Firefox today. Uh, Opera had it, dropped support for it, and re-added it because they're switching to uh, basically Chrome under the covers. Um, IE has not committed. In fact, they kind of submitted their own alternative to the spec because it's Microsoft. <laughs> what a surprise. Um, it probably won't win. A lot of people saw it as really just a delaying tactic. Um, so it probably won't win. But uh, so today, basically. Skype sir? Is there yes, a Skype. Is there called Skype implemented in Internet Explorer? <laughs> yes. So if you're the Microsoft, then you can implement the Skype, Skype standard. Um, it is currently only available on the desktop, but I promise you this will change very quickly. Things like Firefox OS, things like Chrome for mobile, um, these are the guys that are behind the project. They're very interested in WebRTC. They're putting a lot of dollars behind it. It's really only a matter of time before we start seeing it on mobile devices. There are things to consider, like you have to consider battery life on mobile devices. And encoding video is not traditionally thought of as a low battery drain application. So that stuff has to be figured out. It is a very well-funded project. At the beginning of the talk, I talked about the speech API kind of being a stagnant standard. This is exactly the opposite. Um, if anything, there are too many voices in the room. Everybody wants a piece of this WebRTC game. Um, companies like uh, Google, Mozilla, Cisco, Ericsson, Microsoft, I mean, it's, it's you know, who's who of top tech companies. They're all funding this. And so this will come to fruition soon. Um, and so we can expect to see it mainstream probably as soon as next year. I mean, you can use it today between Firefox and Chrome. And if you can control the browser that your users use, say, like in a corporate environment, then you have a possibility here. Uh, everyone else who can't control that, you probably need to wait a bit. But it is coming. And if you want to follow it, there's this really great website, actually, by the same guys that did Talky, the demo we just did. Is WebRTC ready yet? And it shows you the uh, adoption of different browsers, basically which parts of the API they have implemented. Um, so uh, check that out. And one more thing, because uh, what's a talk without a pundit? This is a guy named Dean Bubbly, who's he's, uh, well known in the telephony industry. Um, and he, he produced this chart, which attempts to predict the adoption rate of WebRTC. And what you're looking at is a chart that shows the number of devices that will be WebRTC enabled about over the next two years. And we're currently somewhere uh, Q3, Q4, 2013. We're approaching about a billion devices that are WebRTC enabled. That includes desktop browsers, um, primarily desktop browsers today. But the black part of that chart is mobile devices, specifically phones, that will start to be WebRTC enabled. Google is requiring every new handset to have hardware VP8 encoding, for example. So those will become WebRTC compatible. And then tablets as well. And basically, he's saying that by the end of 2016, we're looking at something like 4 billion devices. This is, this is going to be pretty widespread, and it's going to get here pretty quickly. It's a very exciting time. So if you find all this really exciting, um, 
you should come to this conference. We're putting on a conference in Atlanta. It's next month. It's, uh, it's in Decatur at our offices. It's Adhesion Conf. Uh, the, the conference came out of the Adhesion community. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, Adhesion, a Ruby framework for voice applications. We are all Rubyists at our heart. Um, we tend to work on back-end code. Thanks to WebRTC, we're kind of getting pulled into the front end a little bit. We have some really great speakers. We have the project lead from the Astros project coming to talk. We have the guy that literally wrote the book on WebRTC. He's on the standards body, a guy named Dan um, um, Barnett. He's going to be here to speak. Uh, anyway, we have the early word pricing closed on Monday, but we extended it because you guys uh, may not have heard about it yet. If you put an ATL rug as the discount code, you'll get the early bird pricing. Highly recommend it. Two days. It's our fourth year doing it. Um, it's a lot of fun. So I would love to see some of the Ruby community from Atlanta show up there. It'd be, it'd be awesome. So that's it. Um, I'm Ben Klang, uh, company's Mojo Lingo. The project is Adhesion. Some links there to various spec documents, and I would love to answer any questions you guys have. Yes? Is there any capability at all for capturing the desktop? Yes, so the question is, is there any capability for capturing the desktop? And yes. In fact, if you look at the talkie demo, there's a button at the top. I think it was a talkie demo. Uh, it says share desktop. Okay. Was that on there? Yeah. Someone, OK. So yes, so WebRTC is really cool. Not only does it allow you to capture um, camera and mic, it also has provisions for something called data channels, which will enable peer, direct peer-to-peer -peer data streams. So one of the first applications for this is a game called Banana Bread. Um, and the name has absolutely nothing to do with the game. It's a first-person shooter. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So it, Banana Bread is really cool. It combines WebRTC for the communication. So basically, as you're playing this first-person shooter, you can chat with other people using voice. It uses WebGL to render the levels. So you, you basically drop into this thing, and you're playing a 3D game in the browser. With The only thing you download are the textures. Um, it uses WebRTC data channel to send position reports. So basically, which direction am I facing, how fast am I running, and when I shoot, all of that goes out over a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, so I just basically tell everybody my position updates, and everybody can see all that. And that's, that's really pretty slick, the fact they can do all of that in the browser. So data channels, some people say that the real win for WebRTC is going to be actually the peer-to-peer -peer elements, where we can directly share files, share desktops. I mean, all that, you know, think about WebEx. Think about GoToMeeting. These guys are really going to be disrupted, especially if they don't take advantage of some of this very quickly. It's so easy to use. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned FreeSwitch for uh, kind of, I guess, redirecting the traffic through their own server. Do you know if any, if there's any uh, WebRTC server type thing that can route the video through as well? I don't know if FreeSwitch or uh, Asterisk, Asterisk do that or not. Sure. So the question is, uh, is there a, and I'm assuming you prefer open source, Yeah, probably. open source <laughs> server that can route the video as well as the audio from WebRTC clients? So pass through, yes. Both FreeSwitch and Asterisk can pass through audio and video. Um, I don't recall whether either can record. They can definitely both record the audio. Um, I would think they can record the video, but I'm not 100% sure. The main thing they can't do is transcode. So one of the big use cases for FreeSwitch and Asterisk has always been, um, I've got a SIP client over here that speaks uh, G711. I've got another one over here that speaks G729. I need someone to transcode between the two. Video is so compute intense intensive that they don't, they don't bother. Um, plus, there are intellectual property pitfalls with H.264. They didn't want to get involved in that. So um, I, they should at least be able to record. They may or may not be able to interact with the video streams, but they will at least pass it through. Okay, yes? Are you going to have these slides on the website? Yes. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter, I will tweet them. It'll probably be later this evening. But yes, um, I will definitely put the slides online. I've got a bunch of slides. If, uh, I've got like a two years worth of them if you want to. But these will be online. On YouTube, along with the other ATL rods. Yeah. yeah. Cool. We'll, we'll I'll put we'll links to the, the slides if you'll send them to somebody. Certainly, yeah. Um, yes, let me get your information after it. I'll send it to you. Any other questions? Yes. And just so you know, the template slide does work on, at least the latest Android. Device. Really? Yep. Excellent. A mobile device that supports WebRTC. to see. That's very exciting. So Android Chrome, latest version. Supports whatever. That is awesome. Let's get in there. 4.3 works. 4.3? 4.4? Really cool. 4. 4. Awesome. I, 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 can't, I can't say for older versions. I know for this particular device. That is awesome. That's the first time I've done one of these, and someone actually said it worked on my mobile. So that's awesome. It's, it's coming. What else? Any other questions? No? 
Okay. Well, come to it here's conf. Love to continue these conversations. Ask me questions. I love this stuff. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL RUG videos playlist.